We begin with breaking news about the coronavirus. All of Italy, a country of 60 million people, is now effectively a red zone. Tonight, Texas Senator Ted Cruz said he will self-quarantine. The predictions about the catastrophe that is the coronavirus get more ominous by the day. Michigan still has no confirmed cases of the coronavirus or COVID-19 as we record this, but it's almost inevitable it'll come to our state. And frankly, there's good information out there around it, but there's lots of noise and not a ton of signal. So we turn to some smart people to help us make sense of it all. Today, we do a deep dive on what the dangers are from coronavirus with an infectious disease expert from Beaumont Health, plus how to help prevent the spread. Then some practical tips to help you work from home from freelance marketing expert Latasha James. And finally, what the impact on the economy could be as it stands today. That's all coming up on Your Daily Detroit for Tuesday, March 10th, 2020. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. Before we get started, a quick thank you to our members for making shows like this possible. Your support is crucial to keep independent, smart media making podcasts like this one. So join us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. And thank you. All right. Before we get into this, just want to reiterate, there are currently no confirmed coronavirus cases here in Michigan as of this recording, although that could certainly change at a moment's notice. As of March 9th, 39 people in Michigan had tested negative for the virus and 124 were still being monitored. Tests are pending on 24 people. Common symptoms of the coronavirus are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. They may appear anywhere from 2 to 14 days after exposure. It's believed to spread mostly through respiration droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. On Tuesday, the state of Michigan said its Medicaid program would waive copays and all cost sharing for testing for coronavirus. And a number of health insurers and health providers have said they will cover corona tests in full, waiving all copays and deductibles. They include Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Priority Health, CVS Health, McLaren, and Meridian Health. As we mentioned yesterday on our show, the city of Detroit's Water and Sewerage Department and the state are working to stop water shutoffs from happening and turn city residents' water back on. The water turn-ons will be paid for with state dollars. All right, we turn to a medical expert to help us get a better sense of what to make of all this hubbub around coronavirus. Dr. Matthew Sims is Director of Infectious Disease Research at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak. And before we get into that conversation, just want to be transparent and let you know that I do some paid freelance writing for Beaumont Health. All right, here's our conversation with Dr. Sims. Dr. Sims, a lot of people are kind of brushing off coronavirus saying, you know, this is no big deal. It's just, you know, a slightly more potent form of the flu, but this is everything's a giant overreaction being fueled by a lot of media hype. Are they right? You know, just like anything else, it's not that simple. Coronavirus, first, it's not the flu. It's a completely different virus. It is a respiratory virus. It affects the lungs just like the flu does. And right now, it's spreading. It's mostly in China till now, but it's taking off around the world more, and in certain countries worse than others. Um, And it's here in the U.S., of course. So people are worried. Like most strains of the flu, it seems to affect older people more. Uh, Unlike the flu, it does not seem to affect young kids very much. What worries people is it's new, right? So... The flu is kind of like an old friend. We're used to it. Despite the fact that doctors and health officials constantly warn people that you really need to get the flu shot to help reduce the risk of getting the flu, to prevent the spread of flu in the population, it's still an underutilized vaccine because, you know, people sort of underestimate the flu. Everybody knows the flu. It's always there. People remember SARS, which was another coronavirus, which Luckily enough, they were able to end that outbreak. Mm -hmm. And that had lots of people on ventilators and higher mortality than this does. But it was it was scary. That was sort of the first of the respiratory outbreaks, you know, within recent memory. The reaction of fear is sort of understandable. Do we need to be quite as aggressive about it as we are? Well, everything we're doing now is to try to keep it under control as much as possible. If we let it go out of control, no, no sort of thought in terms of you know how to prevent its spread, et cetera, then you know a large portion of the population is going to get affected. 
it could potentially overwhelm our ability to deal, to deal with it. You know, if everybody gets sick at once, it's really going to be hard to, you know, sort of handle the day-to-day life. Yeah. Now, that being said, that hasn't happened yet. And in some countries, you know, in China, they locked everything down and it really became restrictive. In Italy, they're now locking everything down. It's becoming really restrictive. Here in the U.S., we're certainly not up to that. There are a number of places that have declared states of emergency. And that's mostly to get help with all the stuff that I was talking about, keeping it under control. You know, it's hard to say what's an overreaction and what's not. I think that some of the things that have been done are definitely overreactions. You know, everybody going out and buying out every N95 mask they can find, overreaction. Mm -hmm. First, it's not going to actually protect people on the streets. Second, those are needed in hospitals because where they're the actual people with the virus are being contained and, and other things, not just N95s, you know, are not a new thing created just for the coronavirus. They're used every day in hospitals for things like tuberculosis and measles and, you know, other things that require this isolation. When used appropriately with the right combination of protective equipment, it prevents spread in limited manners, in very specific manners. If you're wearing it on the street, it's not going to protect your eyes. It's not going to protect you from touching the, you know, the surface that has the virus on it and then later touching your face and getting it that way. There's definitely overreaction and then there's appropriate reaction. It's all getting kind of mixed together. Is it inevitable that it comes to Michigan? I mean, we haven't had a reported case yet that I'm aware of, but uh, is that inevitable? Yeah, we're one of the last few states that hasn't. You know, it's probably going to get here. I, I would not at all be surprised if it got here. It's spreading, right? It's spreading in the population, but slowly. And the fact of the matter is most people who get it, it's a fairly mild illness. And so they're, you know, not thinking about, is this going to, is this Corona? Is it going to spread? We don't know how many people get it and don't really have very much in the way of symptoms at all, but could potentially spread it. You know, I I would not be surprised if it got here at all. I would actually be surprised if it never made it here. What are you doing at Beaumont uh, to prepare for coronavirus and and how uh, will you treat it if and when it gets here? You know, we have policies in place to try to minimize the impact on the system as a whole. So just like when measles hit a few months ago, you know, we have rules into play that people who have these respiratory issues and fever shouldn't just come directly into the emergency room they should be met, put in a mask, isolated until the testing is done. That's a good idea with any respiratory condition that could potentially spread. It's a good idea with flu. It's a good idea with measles. That's why we were doing it with measles. But with corona, because of its potential to spread and the fact that people aren't going to have any sort of baseline resistance because it's a new virus, it's important to do that. In terms of treatment, the standard treatment right now is supportive care. For most people, they don't need any special treatment. But for the extreme cases, they do. I mean, they can need a ventilator or something like that. And there are medications that we think may have activity, but we don't know for sure. There are some clinical trials that are happening around different places um, and the potential to uh, get patients involved in those sort of things. There's a drug that's been used to treat uh, HIV that seems to have activity against this virus. There's another drug that uh, in develop- was in development for Ebola that seems to have activity against this virus. Um, there are a number of other drugs that have been used for various conditions that seem to have activity against this virus, but we don't know for sure whether or not the activity that we see in the lab will translate to activity with people when you're treating a sick patient. And that's why clinical trials are so important. You know, when Ebola was a big thing, Everybody was pushing, oh, you know, there's these new drugs in development. Give them to people, give them to people, give them to people. And there was some early indication that those drugs might work. But, you know, the fact of the matter is some of those drugs didn't work. And without doing clinical trials, without treating people in a very controlled manner and collecting the data to see, did it really make things better? You just never know. And once it's something sort of starts getting used routinely for something, whether it works or not, people get used to using it. Now, if you can't get a person into a clinical trial and you have them in front of you and they're very sick and you're desperate, you know, is it reasonable to try some of these drugs that are already approved for other reasons? Well, it's called using something off-label. Any doctor can decide to do that. Mm -hmm. People probably will, but we have to be very thoughtful when we do these things because if we're not, 
just everything will get out of control and we won't know what's really helping people. Right. So Dr. Sims, you're director of infectious disease research at Beaumont. I assume you probably talk to a lot of peers who work at different health systems, you know, around Michigan, around the country and everything. You know, there's been a lot of talk about how well prepared we are uh, as a country for a, an outbreak if it becomes serious. You know, that there's not enough testing kits available, that uh, there has been, you know, funding has been cut for key programs and and positions. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of uh, dispute about the politics, uh, you know, behind the scenes of all this. I mean, what's your view? How well prepared is the United States if this becomes serious? Without trying to get into politics, you know, I think the U.S. is reasonably prepared. There's no such thing as any country that's fully prepared for a pandemic, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's sort of what causes a pandemic. If an infection spread like wildfire through the population, there's only so much anybody can do about that, right? And everybody will do their their best to handle it. But there's no way, you know, if 50% of the United States population suddenly needed to be on a respirator, there aren't enough respirators in the world to cover that. That's a difficult thing to face up to. But I mean, that's just sort of a fact of life. It's, that, that has nothing to do with politics or cuts or anything. That's just, you know, if something that serious happened, there's not a lot that anybody anywhere would be able to do. There's not a country in the world that would be ready for that. Now, that being said, that's not what coronavirus is. Coronavirus, you know, 80% of the people it affects have mild cases. They'll be able to do fine at home with, you know, hydration and rest and, you know, symptomatic relief. It's the people who, you know, are serious that there's a concern. And of course, some of those, you know, again, it's going to range from, you know, they need oxygen to they need to be on an intubate, you know, to be on a, on a respirator intubated. I think that we'll handle this fairly well. But as, as you know, I mean, it's already becoming disruptive to, and we don't have that many cases in the United States yet, but it's already becoming disruptive. You hear about meetings being canceled, the travel being put off, and people not wanting to go out, and people hoarding. It's a natural response to the fear of what's going on. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen in the long run. Yep. But everything appropriate is being done. What's your best doctor's advice uh, for people to just kind of uh, stay safe? If you're older and have comorbid conditions, cardiac problems, lung problems, you're the person who's most at risk. So you should be avoiding big crowds and things like that. Hand hygiene is incredibly important because probably as many or more people are getting it by touching the virus and then later touching their eye or eating something that they've touched or, you know, somehow getting it in from their hands. So hand hygiene, hand sanitizer, soap and water, hand sanitizer sold out everywhere because people are, are buying it like crazy. Cough etiquette, right? First, if you're sick, stay home or call your doctor and get advice on what to do. They may say, come to my office, meet me outside. We'll put you in a mask. They may say, call the emergency room. They'll put you in a mask. They'll test you, those sort of things. It may not have any, you know, most of what's going to happen right now is probably not going to be coronavirus. Flu, much more common right now. That's my next piece of advice. Everybody who doesn't have a medical contraindication to it should have their flu shot. People will talk about, oh, the flu shot makes me sick. It it gave me the flu. Impossible. The flu shot doesn't have live virus in it. It can't give you the flu. The reason people think that is because they get the shot during flu season and they've either already been infected with the flu and the shot wasn't given early enough to protect them, or they get another respiratory virus that the flu shot doesn't protect them against because It only protects you against the flu. So it wouldn't protect you against coronavirus, say. But the flu right now, there's a lot more of it and a lot more people around the world have died from it than coronavirus. So that's my next piece of advice. Don't ignore the flu. Right now, it's as bad, it's worse than coronavirus. Cough etiquette. Don't cough, you know, out into the environment. Cough into the crook of your elbow to contain it hands if you have to, but that, you know, then you're getting whatever you coughed on your hands. Use hand sanitizer or soap and water. After that occurs, that's a big thing. Get rest, get good nutrition, stay hydrated, stay healthy. Those are the big pieces of advice I can give. All right. Well, Dr. Matthew Sims, Director of Infectious Disease Research at Beaumont Hospital. Thanks so much for coming on Daily Detroit. Happy to. 
Joining me on the line is Latasha James. She is a freelance marketer and somebody who I wanted to turn to because I know that there are a lot of people dealing with some challenges that they're not used to in their work environment, namely the fact that with all of the concern around the coronavirus or COVID-19, there are more and more folks that need to work from home. Some of these folks might even be people who don't who have never worked from home before or are used to working the corporate job and like one person I know literally setting up an office in their basement. So, Latasha, first off, welcome to Daily Detroit. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I, I first saw a little bit of this on your Instagram and I wanted to like go into it deeper. You have been a freelancer for a for quite a while. It's your career. But part of that challenge is when you work from home, you've got to create some spaces and do some things to be productive. What are some of the things that you've learned? Sure. Yeah. So I've been freelancing for the past few years. And even before that, I've been I worked remotely for a lot of my corporate jobs. So I've been working from home for probably five or six years and definitely understand that struggle. I think one of the biggest things that has helped me is separating my space and forcing myself to have a true workspace. And I live in a a small apartment. I live in a one bedroom apartment. So it's challenging because I don't really have a formal office. But even if it's just sitting at your kitchen table and, and designating that as your workspace, I personally have a desk that I've kind of, you know, played around with the furniture and separated, um, you know, used a bookshelf to separate my living space from my workspace and really just being strict with myself about not working from bed, not working from the couch, because the second I do that, one, my productivity levels go way down and two, it makes it so much harder to turn off at night, you know, when it's five or 6 PM and I'm wanting to watch a movie or I'm ready to go to bed. It's, it it turns your bed or your couch into a workspace and it's really hard to disconnect. So that's probably my biggest tip is finding a good workspace. And from what you're saying, it's not like you have to go out and spend a much, a bunch of money to do this, right? Not at all. Like I said, sit at a table, you know, sit at just a corner of, of your space, wherever you have a nice, a nice space to work at. I even, uh, for a while I used one of those little trays, uh, like the fold out trays kind of things like the lap desks, I guess they're called. And you can just use a chair. I mean, whatever it is that just you're able to turn into your designated workspace, that's not going to interfere with your personal life too much. About the disconnection, because I think that's a big thing where you're doing your work, but it feels like you can never leave it because whether you have a small place like yours or you're working at home and you have a, you know, maybe a, a couple of bedrooms, maybe you're dealing with kids, all that kind of stuff. What are some of your tips around disconnection and actually saying, all right, because I think so many people are used to, they go to work, they leave, there's the drive home, there's that like convenient wall. Do you have any tips around disconnection and making sure that like the anxiety doesn't hit you and you just dive right back into it? Yes. Yeah. So I love that you mentioned the commute. I say do something similar, you know, establish a routine. So in the morning for me, I have my kind of morning routine where I try my best to get out of the house, even if it's just walking around my community or walking to go grab a coffee or whatever it is. Same thing in the evening. I usually go take a walk. I really like coffee. So I usually get another (laughs) cup of coffee or whatever it is. You know, you don't have to be buying anything or doing anything. Just take a walk, have a routine, go to the gym, um, whatever it is that you're into and, and have that be your evening routine. Uh, that really helps me disconnect and kind of turn off from the workday and turn on to the evening and spending time with family or whatever it is. And are there any like key things that we we haven't touched on that you want to make sure that people know about if they're going through this journey? Yeah. You know, another struggle for me recently, I live in an apartment, like I said, and so noise, I think is something that a lot of people mm, yeah, are yeah. Quite, quite prepared for you're, if you're used to working in an office. So having a headset, it's so, such a simple thing, but I bought a really cheap, uh, it looks like I work in a call center. It's just like a typical headset with the the kind of microphone arm has helped me so much just because it, every little thing is going to pick up. If you live in an apartment, the traffic outside, your neighbor's dogs, your dog, your children, your significant other taking a shower, whatever is going on. So having a headset really helps. And then, of course, use that mute button when you're on your conference calls. Don't forget to mute when you're not talking if you don't want anything weird picking up on your on your call. <laughs> well, those are all really great tips. Latasha, where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? 
Yeah, sure. So I offer a ton of other resources for freelancers and entrepreneurs. So if you're into that type of content, definitely visit me over at latashajames.com. And on social, I'm just the Latasha James. Well, Latasha James, thank you so much for your time on Daily Detroit today. Thank you. We've seen major economic ramifications of the coronavirus already, but much of that is no doubt yet to play out. Oh, for sure. There are reverberations, frankly, across the globe from China to Italy. And here, it's it's been a wild ride on Wall Street. The Dow dropped 2,000 points on Monday, its worst points drop ever, although it has regained some of its uh, momentum. It remains very volatile. Though. Super volatile. All of this is also complicated because there are multiple factors happening right now. There's also an oil price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. So you kind of take both of these factors, put them together, and you have like an economic suck soup. Yeah. You know, for sure. You've got all of Italy under quarantine right now as a preventative measure, which I think is is interesting. It's not that people are necessarily locked in their homes, but they're really trying to keep people they're trying in place. To. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're trying to. I, I saw a video of, a, of like an Italian police car like broadcasting to people going down an empty street. You know, in these apartment tower district, you know, broadcasting out its loudspeakers, please stay inside if unless you absolutely have to leave. Right. And you need passes to use public transit, go through certain roads. That's crazy. Things like that. It only has to be for uh, emergency use and uh, a couple of specialty work purposes. And, you know, people are being told to prepare and already are working from home. That's one of the reasons I wanted to make sure to have Latasha on. Yeah. Because I know multiple people that have been either told that they need to work from home, they've had all of their travel eliminated, like a lot of business folks, where they've had multiple trips taken out and that's not happening anymore. So it's really changing the flow of work. And, you know, you're going to get into this in a second. Large gatherings, too, are being canceled. And I wonder how much of a long-term effect that this is going to have on the economy when you kind of realize that maybe you do need these things or maybe you don't need to get together with all these virtual tools. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, the coronavirus is showing us how economically vulnerable we are to like a large global pandemic like this, right? As I've mentioned many times, I do some auto writing on the side, right, for auto blog. Just last week, we had the Geneva Auto Show, which is one of the big international auto shows in Switzerland, was canceled at the last minute. Uh, so, you know, there were videos out there that showed the convention hall there in Geneva that, you know, where there were like these like three quarters built displays, you know, that automakers had already spent lots of money to put together and everything. And then the show just gets axed at the last minute and Oof. nobody goes, yeah, I'm sure that that hurt. Cadillac uh, more recently just announced it was going to postpone the unveiling of a new electric vehicle. They're calling it the Lyric. It's L Y. R-I-Q. That's a big new release for them. It's going to be riding on a new electric vehicle platform that GM has developed that's going to serve as the base for a whole host of new electric vehicles they're set to unveil. When you're talking about these shows and these unveilings, I can't help but think about the people lower on the economic ladder that are getting impacted by this. Sure, all the, I mean, your Uber drivers, your, your hotel, hotel workers, workers, restaurant I mean, workers, people who need these jobs and need these paychecks and do not have the any carpenters kind of... and millwright people who set up the exhibits and stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. Absolutely. Well, I think the a lot of eyes are on the New York Auto Show, which is supposed to happen early next month in New York City. I got an email from the show, I don't know, a few days ago saying that, you know, they were uh, intent on holding the show, you know, continuing to hold the show and then we're in close contact with, you know, city and regional officials, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think anybody would be surprised to see that one get canceled. Another interest, you know, important point is that this coronavirus originated from Wuhan in China. And uh, that's a very industry heavy place. It's kind of, you know, China has become sort of the world's supply chain. It's, you know, all supply chains run through China, right? The Chinese government extended the National Lunar New Year holiday by 10 days last month and has been really slow to kind of start restart production at a lot of the factories overseas there. So that's taken a big chunk out of, you know, lots of companies beyond just the auto industry, obviously. I mean, people forget how much of the supply chains are tied to China in all kinds of large and small ways because so many of these uh, complicated cars, parts, 
this stuff is crisscrossing our the computers, globe. our phones. Yeah, I mean everything. It, it all goes through China at some point. Yeah, I don't think you can actually like make a computer in the United States right now. I don't think we have the factories. I doubt it. No, not especially semiconductors and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So we don't really even know where all this is going. You know, much will depend on the severity of the outbreak and how it it plays out and how long it lasts, frankly. But uh, it's not good. No question about that. I mean, I look at that clock and I go, you know, June isn't that far away. And that's when the North American International Auto Show is coming. Yeah, the new Detroit Auto Show. Yeah, the new Detroit Auto Show. I mean, that is, I mean, June, so April, May, you're there. You know, even if they decide to keep it going, you know, by then, who knows what's going to happen by then. But, you know... A lot of people may be too spooked to come out and and be around large crowds, and that'll keep you know attendance down. So lots of and I mean it, it, that's the thing. Everything is unknown, or it could be you know start to recede by that. We we don't know. Yeah, we honestly don't know. All righty, that's going to do it for today's show. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend about Daily Detroit. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And consider supporting us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. Until next time, stay healthy, take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit.